This is America Daily, bringing you the best in truthful news updates and in-depth reports happening now. Welcome to America Daily. I'm Mark Jackson. Jeffrey Epstein's death Saturday morning has raised a lot of questions, including whether or not he actually committed suicide or whether he was murdered. Today, we take a closer look at Epstein, his strange rise in the financial world, his crimes, and some of the theories about his death. Here to tell us more is Tabitha Smiles. The Life of Jeffrey Epstein Fox News reported that Jeffrey Epstein, age 66, was found unconscious in his cell on August 10, 2019, around 6.30 a.m. in the Manhattan Prison Metropolitan Correctional Center. He was transported to the New York Presbyterian Lower Manhattan Hospital and was dead upon arrival, officials said. Epstein's death comes two weeks after the 66-year-old was placed on a suicide watch after he was found nearly unconscious in his cell with injuries around his neck. At the time, it was not clear whether the injuries were self-inflicted or from an assault. He had been taken off of suicide watch before he killed himself. A person familiar with the matter told AP it wasn't immediately clear as to why he was taken off of suicide watch. Many people are asking, how did this happen? Why would Epstein kill himself if he was talking and making deals with the court? This sounds like someone who is actually trying to save himself, not kill himself. A.G. Barr has also stated in a statement Saturday that he was appalled to learn of the death and the inspector general would open an investigation into the circumstances of his death. The FBI is also going to investigate Mr. Epstein's death, and it raises serious concerns that must be answered, A.G. Barr said. The Epic Times, a Manhattan-based newspaper, reported that Epstein was reportedly put in a cell by himself in the protective custody wing of the federal detention facility after an apparent suicide attempt on July 24th. In that wing, being alone in a cell means solitary confinement, and the solitary confinement is not a suicide watch, said Bernard Couric on a phone interview with the Epic Times. The Epic Times continued to state that Epstein was previously found injured in his cell on July 24th and with in what his cellmate and unnamed sources described to the media as a suicide attempt. His cellmate, Nicholas Tartaligian, a former police officer on death row for multiple murders, was reportedly questioned about the incident and his lawyer denied his involvement in Epstein's next injuries. Hmm, interesting. Regarding Epstein, Keurig noted that solitary confinement, the inmate is not actually monitored perpetually. The watches are 15 minutes apart, and the inmates know that. That means that after each watch, the inmates have 15 minutes to do whatever they want to do. Eight minutes or more after a suicide attempt, you're brain dead, you're gone. Epstein should have been placed in a setting with other people around, as well as continuous monitoring by a camera. This was stated by Keurig to the Epic Times. After Epstein's death, several sources told NBC News he was not, in fact, on suicide watch. So just to recap, what were Epstein's current charges? Um, Epstein was arrested on July 6th, 2019, over the alleged sexual abuse of a dozens of girls in his Upper East Side town home and his waterfront mansion in Palm Beach, Florida, between 2002 and 2005. Epstein allegedly created and maintained a vast network and operation from 2002 up to and including at least 2005, that enabled him to sexually exploit and abuse dozens of underage girls, in addition to paying victims to recruit other girls. Prosecutors said that victims would be escorted into a room with a massage table where they would perform massages on Epstein. At the time of Epstein's arrest, prosecutors said they found a trove of pictures of nude and semi-nude young girls and women at his mansion in Manhattan. He has pleaded not guilty and faced up to 45 years in prison if he was convicted. And that came from Fox News. So let's look at the tale of Jeffrey Epstein's rise and fall. It's a particularly interesting or peculiar one. Not very much real information is known about him. How did Jeffrey Epstein fall to this level? And where did he go wrong? His life found on Wikipedia, which of course is a questionable source, but it gives at least some of the basic facts, reads like a story of rags to riches. But is it really? How did a man who never got any college degree enter a world of the top elite to manage vast sums of wealth and advise some of the richest people in the world? Our story begins in Brooklyn, New York. His early life, 
was that he was born to a working class family in Brooklyn. He attended public schools. He graduated from high school two years early at the age of 16. He went to college, but never graduated. He graduated in 1969 from the Lafayette High School. At 16, he had skipped two grades, and later that year, he attended classes at Cooper Union until he changed colleges in 1971. From September of 1971, he attended the Concurrent Institute of Mathematical Sciences at New York University and left without receiving a degree in 1974. Epstein started working after the summer of 1974 as a physics and mathematics teacher at the Dalton School in the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Epstein taught in the exclusive private school from the fall of 1974 until he was dismissed in June of 1976. That alone is a meteoric rise. He's a guy from Brooklyn, working class parents, uh, didn't graduate from college, and with right out of college, he gets a job at one of the top level prep schools, uh, private schools. This is where all the elite of Manhattan send their kids. And he's there teaching physics and math without a degree. You got to wonder, how did that happen? Okay, so now he's working at the school. While teaching at the school, Epstein became acquainted with Alan Greensburg, the chief executive officer of Bears Stearns, whose son and daughter were going to the school. The elite go there. Greenberg, impressed with Epstein's intelligence and drive for financial success, offered him a job at Bear Stearns. Wow, very convenient. And no degree at all, no training. Yeah, he's teaching without a degree. I, that's like baffles because I thought there were standards in schools. You know, you, to the resume, you need to have something there. In August 1981, Epstein founded his own consulting firm, Intercontinental Assets Group, which assists clients in recovering stolen money from fraudulent brokers and lawyers. Epstein described his work at this time as being a high-level bounty hunter. He told friends that he worked sometimes as a consultant for governments and very wealthy to recover embezzled funds, while at other times he worked for clients who had embezzled funds. So he's working for both the crook, the crooks and the people who have been victims. And how is he working for governments? To do that kind of dangerous level work, what kind of security do you have? I mean, I, I just like, just think about the world of trying to get money away from crooks. You're going in there as a bounty hunter to get money that's been embezzled. And what kind of special security services do you have with you to protect you from, you know, doing that kind of work? So that alone just like puzzles me completely. So Ana Abregano is one of the well, such wealthy Spanish clients who Epstein helped in 1982 to recover her father's millions that was lost in investments, which had disappeared when Drysdale government securities collapsed and became a fraud. So already Epstein's all around the criminal elements in the world. Epstein also stated to some people that at the time he was an intelligent agent. Whether this statement was truthful or unjust is not clear. During the 1980s, Epstein possessed an Austrian passport that had his photo but a false name. The passport showed his place of residence being in Saudi Arabia. Okay, I, I believe that 100%. And for some reason, it doesn't even strike me as odd that he would have something that crazy. U.S. Florida District Attorney Alexander Acosta, who handled Epstein's case in 2008, stated that he had been told that Epstein belonged to intelligence and was above his pay grade and to leave it alone. During this period of time, Epstein's clients were Saudi Arabian businessman Khashoggi, who was the middleman for transferring American weapons from Israel to Iran as part of the Iran-Contra affair that happened in the 1980s. Khashoggi was one of the several defense contractors that he knew. In the mid-1980s, Epstein traveled multiple times between the United States, Europe, Middle East. While in London, Epstein met Stephen Hoffenberg. They were introduced through Douglas Lease, who was a defense contractor, and John Mitchell, a former U.S. general attorney. So this guy is not swimming in the low end of the pool. So let's just take it back. Within a span of, you know, he graduates in 1969. By 1971, he's working at Dalton. He's only 21, guys. And then from there, he works for two years, swapped right, gets right into Bears and Stern, works there for two years, immediately gets his own firm set up, and he's getting money from some of the biggest, most corrupt people in the world for embezzlement. How do you go and become this headhunter, this bounty hunter who's trying to find all this information? I, I've, this, this is where it gets like interesting. When he says he's intelligence asset, I believe that 100%. He had to have been trained. He had to know muscle. 
who would help him on these adventures in different countries where you would need protection. You can't tell me you wouldn't need a bodyguard or some special ops guys that are for hire, because how could you go get money from all these wealthy people? Do you think they're going to hand it over to him because you have a piece of paper that says you can take it back? Yeah, so that that alone right there is crazy. He basically started another company called the Liquid Funding. And from here, he basically started getting into commercial mortgages, investment grade residential mortgages bundled into complex securities. And the liquid funding was initially 40% owned by Bears and Stern. Through the help of the credit rating agencies Standard and Poor's, Fitch Rating, and Moody's Investor Services, the new bundle security were able to create for companies so that they could get a gold-plated AAA rating. So the implosion of such complex securities because of their inaccurate ratings led to the collapse of Bear Stern, and get this, in March of 2008, and set into motion the financial crisis that happened in the United States and all of the world at 2007 and 2008 and the subsequent Great Recession. If liquid funding, Epstein's company, were left holding large amounts of such securities as collateral, it could have lost large amounts of money. So the question is, did he know this was coming? Did he have an idea that this was coming? <clears throat> did he manipulate something to make this you know, happen? He can't lay it all on his door, but he's right in the thick of it. So you know the saying that they say where there's smoke, there's fire, right? So you just have to look at another prominent company that he's in that goes bad. Bears and Stern goes bad. This one starts to go bad. And he's been involved in numerous of his businesses, either have criminal Uh, complaints against them or fall apart, right? For better or worse. So, but he avoids getting caught every time. So while Epstein was still consulting for Hoffenberg, he founded in 1988 his own financial management firm called J. Epstein and Company. This company was formed to manage assets of clients from that only have more than one billion in net worth. So he won't even take you as a client if you don't have a billion dollars of net worth. The only publicly known billionaire Epstein took care of was Leslie Wexner, who is the chairman and CEO of L Brands, or formerly the Limited Inc., and that's, of course, and Victoria's Secret. So this is uh, this guy is vast, you know, deep pockets. And now, of course, he's alleging that Epstein mismanaged his funds, and he's trying to distance himself from Epstein. In 1986, Epstein met Wexner through a mutual acquaintance, uh, an insurance executive named Robert Meister and his wife in Palm Beach, Florida. A year later, Epstein became Wexner's financial advisor and served as his right-hand man. Within a year, Epstein had sorted out Wexner's entangled finances. In July of 1991, Wexner granted Epstein full power of attorney over his affairs. The power of attorney allowed Epstein to hire people, sign checks, buy and sell property, borrow money, and do anything else of legally binding nature on Wexner's behalf. That is a lot of power given to one guy on in billions of dollars. By 1995, Epstein was the director of the Wexner Foundation and Wexner Heritage Foundation, and he was also the president of Wexner Property which developed the town of New Albany outside of Columbus, Ohio, where Wexner lived. Epstein made millions in fees by managing Wexner's financial affairs. Although never employed by L Brands, he corresponded frequently with the company's executives. Epstein also attended Victoria's Secret fashion shows and hosted the models at his New York City home, as well as helped aspiring models get work with the company, and I'm sure he did. In 1996, Epstein changed the name of his firm to the Financial Trust Company, and for tax advantages, he based it on the island of St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands. By relocating to the Virgin Islands, this acted as an offshore tax haven, while at the same time offering the advantages of being part of the United States banking system. Now, everything I just read here is from Wikipedia, and the reason I'm reading it is so that you can get a clear idea of the kind of businessman uh, he ended up being and how he grew his wealth, because a lot of people are questioning, how did he get that much money uh, in what could be considered a short amount of time? So then the next thing that happened in 2006, Epstein, uh, a month after a federal investigation for him began, he invested $57 million into the Bears Stearns High Grade Structure Credit Strategies it's a, it's a hedge fund. And this fund was a highly leveraged for mortgage-backed collateralized debt. 
So basically, again, he's back with Bear Stearns. He has a long history with them. And they go back and forth. They get into another one. So by the time Bear Stearns fund began to fail, this this fund he gets into starts to fail again. Epstein had already begun to negotiate a plea deal with the U.S. Attorney's Office concerning imminent charges of sex with minors. That was in August 2007. A month later, the fund collapses. The U.S. Attorney in Miami, Alexander Acosta, entered into a direct discussion with the plea agreement. Acosta, he brokered a lenient deal, according to him, because he had been ordered by higher government officials who told him that Epstein was an individual of importance to the government. As part of the negotiations, according to the Miami Herald, Epstein provided unspecified information to the to the federal prosecutors for a more lenient sentence and was supposedly an unnamed key witness in the New York federal prosecutors in their unsuccessful June 2008 criminal cases against the managers of the failed Bear Stearns hedge fund. So he's so wrapped up with these criminals in the financial institutions and he basically he's an asset. Now, the question is, was he an asset and was he groomed to be an asset for the United States government or for the Israeli government? Uh, Because he does look, if you really look at him from a certain perspective, he does have a lot of those setups where it allows him to be in places where he would not, no one would be able to get where he's at. And if he is intelligence and he's giving information back to the government, they're going to overlook pretty much everything he's doing. And then on top of it, I hate to say this, but he knows what all these people are into, right? So he becomes what is like a pimp. But we know that he was also collecting blackmail information. So all of these people getting caught with the underage girls, it's the honey trap thing again, where you've got, you know, their weakness, and you bring them in, you're doing it yourself. So they think, well, hey, he's doing it too. So he's going to get in trouble if I get in trouble. So you can imagine the trust they have, they're all super, super wealthy. Or the other side is that he never thought he would get caught and he could get away with whatever he wanted because he was so well positioned in knowing things and knowing people and governments that he probably felt he had so many high level powered, uh, you know, friends that he would never be made to pay for his crimes. And then just to add this up, he also started a startup in Israel with a with an ex government person there. Um, This person was um, an ex prime minister. Uhad Barak, and who was at one time a defense minister, the chief of Israeli's defensive forces. So basically, he sets up a company there right when he's still in the middle of court and from 2015 all the way to 2018. He's still running businesses and with governments at that. And and basically, he's he's nothing is stopping him, not even all these court things. He keeps going. He keeps doing what he's doing. So the beginning of his troubles actually started in March 2005 when a woman contacted the Florida's Palm Beach Department and alleged that her 14-year-old daughter, uh, stepdaughter, had been taken to Epstein's mansion by an older girl. There she was allegedly paid $300 to strip and massage Epstein. She had allegedly undressed but left the encounter wearing her underwear. Police began a 13-month undercover investigation of Epstein that included a search of his home. The Federal Bureau of Investigations also became involved in the investigation. Subsequently, the police alleged that Epstein had paid several underage girls to perform sexual acts with him, interviews with five alleged victims and 17 witnesses under oath. A high school transcript and other items were found in Epstein's trash and home allegedly show that some of the girls involved were under 18. The police search of Epstein's home found two hidden cameras, large numbers of photos of girls throughout the house, and some of whom the police had interviewed in the course of the interview and the course of their investigation. We all know the names that have come out from the, you know, the exposed court documents. You've got Prince Andrew. Uh, you've got just uh, just a whole host of people. I think Prince Andrew, though, is the one that's got his hand caught because there's pictures of him with one of the underage girls. So he claims he never saw her, met her, but there he is with his arm around her. So that's, you know, that's kind of hard to get out of that one. But the interesting thing is the high powered defense team that Epstein was able to get Roy Black, Gerald LaFort, how Harvard Law Professor Alan Dorschwitz and former Clinton special prosecutor Ken Starr. So he's he got the best of the best to defend him. He gets a sweetheart deal because he's being, you know, other people that are trying to prosecute him are being told he's an asset to the government. So they can't do anything other than give him a slap on the wrist. So the question now is what about the ongoing case? How will this affect the case now? Here is a clip from CNN speaking with Paul Callan, who is a legal analyst, about this very question. 
Joining us now is CNN legal analyst Paul Callen and Eli Honing on the phone. Um, Paul, let me start with you first and foremost. I guess the big question now is what happens to the federal case that was moving forward? Well, the federal criminal case uh, will end uh, with his death. Uh, these criminal cases do not proceed after the death of a criminal suspect. But on the civil side, uh, where people are suing for money damages, those cases will continue. They'll now be converted uh, into an action against the estate of Jeffrey Epstein. And um, he presumably from press reports has a substantial estate. So I would expect the Epstein case will uh, continue uh, full force after, you know, after a, a brief period of time uh, while the lawyers managed to substitute the estate in for Jeffrey Epstein himself. Ali, do you anticipate that there could be even more civil cases brought now? Over the last several weeks and months is that this scheme, this ring was, I think, even far broader than initially reported. We saw some documents unsealed just this week that showed that there were more than dozens, perhaps into the hundreds of victims. And as Paul noted, there's a substantial a state left behind here. Uh, and so those victims, I do expect to see more and more of them coming forward and seeking compensation for, for the, the serious damage that was done to them. So, Paul, let me ask you this. If you've got a, a case against him, you come forward, even in the defamation suit that we were talking about from that was settled in 2017 of those documents that came out today or uh, late last night, um, if you've got a civil suit against him, what more do you have to have to prove your case other than just your word, Paul? Well, you're going to have available pretty much the same amount of information you would have had available even if he were still alive. Because remember, in those civil cases, it's unlikely that Jeffrey Epstein would agree to testify. He would assert the Fifth Amendment and refuse to testify. So the lawyers in those cases have to prove through collateral evidence, through other kinds of evidence, uh, and other witnesses, of which there probably are many, um, the facts of the case. But, of course, in many instances in, uh, in sexual abuse litigation, uh, the case often comes down to the victim herself or himself and their word against um, the defendant. So uh, they managed to corroborate aspects by saying, for instance, that they complained to somebody else uh, around the time the incident happened. No, they might use records to show that they were in the proximity of Epstein during that period of time. There are ways to collaterally support their claims. But frankly, I'm not sure that their difficulty in proving their case will change enormously. Um, there's a lot of research that's been done on him now and thousands and thousands of pages of uh, discovery that's already been generated. So I think you'll see these cases going forward. And I think that it's likely that some of the victims will still be able to prove very strong and compelling cases uh, in courts uh, around the United States. I think you'll see cases uh, filed elsewhere, as well as the ones that are now filed. It's also good to note that New York amended its sexual abuse laws, which means it'll let anyone file a lawsuit against an abuser and there are no longer any time restrictions, whereas before there used to be a statute of limitations, but that has been lifted. So some of the biggest questions being asked now is how did he get away with it for so long? From just the bare facts of his business life, you can see a trend towards fraud and criminal behavior. Maybe all his success owes to the fact that he was blackmailing high-level individuals he felt were untouchable and therefore that would make him untouchable. This would make sense since he never cared to really cover his tracks and he kept photos and incriminating evidence all over his home. And any junior investigator could have pieced all this together. Some may suggest that his death may have been faked since he had high level access to governments and maybe was indeed a security intelligence asset. Could Jeffrey Epstein have just played a part to capture and lure in bigger players for intelligence purposes? He is now in hiding or maybe witness protection. It sounds incredible, but this kind of stuff has happened before. There is hope, though, for his victims, since we know that they can get some compensation for what they had to endure. And maybe in this part, this will be a win for the victims of his crimes. It will be interesting to see what A.G. Barr uncovers, but it's safe to say that the saga is not over yet. Our thoughts go out to the women and other victims of Jeffrey Epstein. We hope they continue to expose the groups and individuals that helped Epstein or were party to his crimes or were even his accomplices. We will continue to follow the story at America Daily. This is Tabitha Smiles. Thanks for listening and hope to see you next time.
This is America Daily, bringing you the best in truthful news updates and in-depth reports happening now. 